enjoyed watching the highlights of the award ceremony. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Ms. Dawn Lim, Executive Director of the Design Singapore Council, to give her welcome remarks. Dawn, please. Hi, good afternoon everyone and thank you for spending your Friday afternoon with us uh, and also for not taking the long weekend out of Singapore and, and being here today, so really appreciate your time. Uh, I thought the video actually did a wonderful job introducing the recipient so that leaves very little for me to say more. Uh, but I thought just a little experience I had, um, I was just sharing with your colleagues just now, uh, they're so lucky that Maxwell Food Center is just across the street. So just before coming here, I, I took a quick uh, lunch break. Uh, incidentally, two tourists uh, shared the table with me. So me being the very capable Singaporean, I was like, hey, are you visiting? What have you seen? Did you go to the city gallery across the street? Uh, and, and through all that conversation, one of the things that came up um, is that Singapore is so unique because we are a city in a garden. And that whole intentionality of building green into every aspect of our lives in a very dense urban environment uh, is core to our ethos and our design um, identity as a nation and as a city. Uh, and four of the recipients are with us today uh, of this year's eight. And three of them, the works that they will share with you today, speak a lot about that ethos that we stand for as a city in a garden. Right, from, from Leonard Ng and the man behind the face of many of our public parks, uh, for which my dog and myself are, are very happy recipients. We spend a lot of time in those parks. Right? Um, to the Woha, uh, Woha the, the, the mines behind the Singapore Pavilion uh, at the Expo 2020, right, which also reflects that Singapore ethos we took overseas and showed the world what that looks like for us. Right? And we have Sura Studio, uh, with Anton, where they took that Singapore ethos to Jakarta and rejuvenated uh, a park that was diminishing, that was degenerating, and they rejuvenated that and gave a new lease of life in the middle of a very dense and bustling city. So there's something here that the Singapore design ethos stands for, that green, that biodiversity, but the ability for us to live together in the city with nature. Now, on that topic of rejuvenation, though, we have uh, Hans Tan Studio, which I took the whole topic of rejuvenation on a different level. And I had the privilege of uh, visiting the showcase at the VNA, uh, which was the first time we did a cross Atlantic, I suppose, uh, cross country uh, creative partnership uh, with a very well known design museum uh, in the UK. And uh, Hans uh, and his uh, a cohort of designers took broken objects from the UK and from Singapore and breathed a new lease of life in them. And in that process, gave it a different meaning and a different value uh, to what the object originally was. One of my favorite ones that I saw, and if you have a chance to take a look at some of the pictures, I hope he'll share some of it later. Um, uh, someone from the public had contributed a little penguin figurine that had lost a wing. So it was a broken-winged penguin. Uh, and Hans had gotten one of the designers to look at how to create, create a new value for that broken item. And what came up was the penguin had a new wing through rattan weaving. It was a rattan wing. And you can only give that with a designer's lens, with a cultural uh, identity from Singapore. And so for the rest of this afternoon, I hope you enjoy the stories that the four of them will share with you. Uh, and through that, I hope you'll be inspired also in your own design journey uh, and continue to fly the Singapore flag high in design. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Ladies and gentlemen, the panel today will discuss the topic, Designing for a Sustainable World. Designing for a more inclusive and sustainable future may sound like a lofty ambition for a small nation like Singapore, but homegrown design solutions can have, a, can have a place on the world map of best design practices. The first speaker representing PDA 2023 Design of the Year Singapore Pavilion Expo 2020 Dubai is architect Hua Hongwei, director at Woha Architects Private Limited. Hongwei graduated with a Master of Architecture from National University of Singapore and joined Woha in 2006. He sees design as an optimistic intervention to maximize potential and catalyze positive change. 
He's interested in a nature-driven approach to architecture and urbanism. Complementing his professional work, Hongwei is a certified ISO auditor, Greenmark accredited professional, and universal design assessor, and has served in the National Library Board and MPARC's design advisory committees on accessibility and skyrise greenery. He was featured in URA's third edition of the 20 Under 45 exhibition in 2017, which presented the works of 20 emerging architects under the age of 45. Hongwei was involved in several award-winning projects, such as Oasia Hotel Downtown, Enabling Village, and the Singapore Pavilion at Expo 2020 Dubai. He is also the architect responsible for the Pan Pacific Orchard Hotel, and is currently working on the NS Square enabling and Enabling Village extension. Let's welcome Hongwei to share more about the Singapore Pavilion Expo 2020 Dubai project. Thank you. Right. Um, good afternoon. Our appreciation to the judging panel and the organizers for according this uh, award to the Pavilion. Um, Expo is one of a kind. It happens every five years. It's a microcosm of the world. It brings country together in one place. And of course, Expo 2020 was made more eventful with COVID. While the countries were not on the same boat, we were all in the same storm. So on behalf, we'd like to acknowledge and thank everyone in the Singapore and Dubai team for weathering the storm together. Well, the pavilion is no longer around, but our hope is that through, through it, we have seeded some optimism and, fo and hope for a better future that values nature. So, since its beginning, all the way back in 1851, Expo has always been an experien experien experimental field that uh, enriches the world. It brought to the world innovations and inventions in food like ketchup, instant coffee, to technology like telephone, typewriter, touchscreen. And Expo 2020 looks at the future, the future of our lives, our city, our earth. The master plan is organized around a central plaza, the Awasa Plaza, with loops to three thematic districts the Opportunity District in yellow, the Mobility District in blue, and the Sustainable District in green. And Singapore is located here at the Sustainable District. And Singapore is among almost 200 exhibitors in this World Fair. And of course, we ask ourselves why we visit the Singapore Pavilion and how can Singapore stand out? So as a small country, Singapore is connected, is both connected and affected by the world. The world grapples with issues like climate change, loss of biodiversity, population growth, rapid urbanization. So these are all issues of global urgencies and currency. And we have come to know Singapore as a city in nature with uh, emphasis on livability and sustainability. So Expo 2020 was a unique opportunity to share with the world how Singapore is tackling these uh, complex issues through planning, through design, through innovations. So we asked, how is Singapore a city in nature? How do we showcase Singapore in a desert? And how does Singapore design for a better future? This was a photo of the site uh, taken in November 2019. Uh, it's taken below the sheltered linkway that connects all the pavilion, as you can see. It was harsh, it was barren, it was really hot. And this was the photo of the site of the pavilion uh, one year later in October 2021. It's taken in front of the sheltered linkway. And what we have done here was we created an oasis in the desert. We wanted the pavilion to be an escape from the hustle and bustle of the expo where visitors are instinctively drawn to nature. And we wanted the pavilion to be open, to be porous, to be inviting. It brings visitors on an experiential journey through a three-dimensional garden. I will bring you through the layers in the next few slides. 
At the start, visitors walk into a lush ground garden, a respite from the surroundings. Key programs are, and touch points are housed within three green cones. Moving from cone to cone, visitors will have moments of relief with the lush greenery. An elevated canopy walk weaves the journey together along the perimeter, around, through the cones, and up the 9 meter space. We wanted to create a stroll in a park. A hanging garden hangs above the cone, and the journey accumulates at the Sky Market. It is an open plan deck for gatherings and events. And last but not least, uh, we kept the pavilion with a solar canopy with some pipes that maximize solar energy and daylighting. So we opened on 1st October 2021, almost a year after the original opening due to COVID. At the entry, visitors are engaged by the different layers of greenery, both in front as well as above. The phytoremediation pond in front creates a calm mirrored surface that reflects and mirror and multiplies the greenery. We have three cones, the rainforest cone, city cone, and the flower cone, all lined up along the center, surrounded by forests. Once in, visitors are surrounded by nature, three-dimensionally. The paths meanders between a thick green edge and the green cones, with the canopy walk zipping overhead. And visitors are ushered into the city cone, uh, first for a multimedia show. The form of the cone presents a 360-degree canvas for an immersive surround experience inside. The show is directed by Brian Gotong, our local Brian Gotong. It shows the visitors um, through the world we, want to, we are in and the world we want to be in after which the visitors journey up the canopy walk along the perimeter to take in the sights and sounds. We created lookouts for vantage points, and these vantage points are cooled by mist fans. These fans, uh, combined with the shade and greenery, lowers the perceived temperature by 5 to 10 degrees compared to the outside temperature, making it comfortable for visitors even without air conditioning. Next, um, we brought the visitors through the three cones in series. Um, visitors first encountered the rainforest cone, uh, which showcases tropical plants on the walls. It emphasizes our Singapore effort and drive to conserve our nature and to extend its footprint vertically. Then the visitors cut through the city cone in the center before walking into the flower cone. The flower cone is where our national flower is on vibrant display. Four terraniums are set against a wall with more than 50 native orchid species whose colors are accentuated by a play of light. The terranium shows Singapore's innovation to propagate and to populate native species in our cities. And outside, visitors will see tracks curling around the cones these are for prototype climbing robots equipped with cameras and sensors that monitor the health of the plants, collect the data such as humidity, oxygen level. So with the information collected, the amount of water and light can be calibrated. Visitors mix it back to the rainforest cone, walking up a spiral with a kinetic titero cup artwork spinning downwards in the center. The Sky Market is an open-sided deck with the top of the three cones as a series of nodes. At the center, we have the red dot for events that is flanked by pantries serving local food. And a sunken arena is located above the flower cone. The arena is a multi-purpose space. It's a gathering space for programs, for events. It's also an amphitheater for Singapore-made shows. Visitors take the stairs down to the gallery where specially curated pieces that illustrate our local creativity and culture are on display, together with the stories of the artists, the makers, and the entrepreneurs. 
And we wanted to end the journey, the journey with some fun. Um, salad dressing here created an interactive game, Digital Nature, which simulates a virtual utopia where players play to nurture nature. Through playing, uh, it shares the workings of the pavilion. It's a reminder for the visitors, especially kids, on how their individual actions have on the collective outcome of the environment. Three times every evening, visitors are treated to a light show with a soundscape composed by our local Don Richmond. The lighting accentuates the pavilion forms and landscape, presenting a different experience at night. This photo here was taken a month about a month, just before opening. Outside, it was looking all lush and serene. But trust me, inside, there was a lot of activities trying to complete the fi finishing touch to ready the pavilion to welcome the visitors. And since opening, the reception to the pavilion has been really positive. The Singapore Pavilion had more than a million visitors, all interested in knowing how a sustainable oasis in a desert can be created and how nature can nurture the future. And Singapore Pavilion is recognized as one of the greenest pavilion at the Expo. More than 50% of the ground is planted. Overall, it achieves 170% green replacement. And beyond the greenery, the pavilion is a water and energy machine, achieving 100% water and energy source efficiency and treating 100% of its organic output through a biodigester. And the local media picked up the ambitions of uh, the pavilion. It shows that there must be stewardship and responsibility in the design of our built environment in countering climate change. And more so, the pavilion also brings together the depth and breadth of the Singapore DNA and brands in the use of the building material, the food they serve, the merchandise, the videos, and the stories. So beyond the greenery, the pavilion is transformative in its working. All its energy used for desalination, for lighting, for irrigations, for fans, are all predetermined, calibrated, and monitored. We have more than 500 solar panels that supply enough energy for the six months duration of the expo. It's designed to be self-sufficient. Did it all go according to plan? No. There were days of sandstorm where the sand blanket the PV panels in the plants and clogged the irrigation. We have to hose and blow them off and fix them. But these are irregularities and spikes on good days and weeks. Um, the system works. Every photon that we collected is not wasted. Part of the energy harnessed from the solar canopy powers the glow lights under the shade to promote plant growth and photosynthesis. Water is scarce. As part of the water conservation effort, water is drawn from the ground, powered by solar energy, desalinated on site and distributed. And likewise, Every drop is not wasted. Water is optimized in the sustenance, in the operation of the pavilion. And water is experienced through the mist fans and water features. Together, the blue and the green helps to increase humidity and the thermal comfort of the, uh, within the pavilion. Well, this photo shows a thermal sensor shooting at the spot just along the edge on the left and on the green wall on the right. The ambient temperature there was 42 degrees Celsius. The shelter area was 36. The green wall is 29. So standing there, you can feel the difference. The Singapore Pavilion demonstrated that a self-sustaining oasis in the desert is possible. And together with it, a thriving nature will invite biodiversity. We had a local dove nesting at the entrance. Um, two eggs were hatched and they became additional touch point and attraction as part of the journey. And to give context to the visitors as well as the locals, we compared the ecosystem services of the pavilion against um, local typologies. 
and we postulate, what if Dubai have many Singapore pavilion, many oases? It points to a different future, one that is nurtured by nature. I'd like to end off with um, the future we choose will depend, will require us to pay attention to our bond with nature. And Singapore Pavilion shares with the world that Singapore is shaping a different future with our built environment. One that is nurtured by nature, one that is resilient and regenerative. And we definitely look towards a better future. It has been an honor for the team. Thank you. Thank you, Hongwei, for the insightful sharing. Next, we have Design of the Year, Tibet Eco Park. Representing Tibet Eco Park is Mr. Anton Sura, director at Sura Studio Private Limited. Anton is an accredited landscape architect and principal of Sura Studio. Throughout his design career, Anton has played a major role in urban design and landscape architecture projects across Singapore, Indonesia, and beyond. Prior to establishing Sura Studio, he played a key role in the design process of numerous award-winning projects, such as the Pongal Promenade, Bidadari Park, and Kampong Admiralty. Anton has also taught landscape architecture design students at the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts and the National University of Singapore. Anton, please. Thank you for the introduction. And first of all, I would like to congratulate for the organizers to arrange these beautiful awards. Uh, for me, is a very significant milestone for our practice. And also congratulate to all the recipients. This year, we have uh, eight uh, award recipients. Four is architectural and four is non-architectural design uh, for general design. And I noticed through my preparation of my presentation today, I noticed there's a shared common thread for the a design of the year for the non-architectural category. This is about reinventions. And uh, reinvention is really about the art of turning adversity into opportunity, setbacks into comebacks. So you know, if you want to win the next year awards, <laughs> this is the one of the tips. And Tabari Kopa is the uh, reinvention of the hacker is really about um, finding um, hacking the IKEA furniture into a dementia-friendly uh, object and R for repair. I think Hans will explain later how to turn an ordinary object into a artworks, if I, I, if I say it like that. And the Tabari Copa is the same. It's about reinvent about the park that has been neglected for many years. This was the condition prior to the revitalization. The park has been damaged. There's a canals and it's separated by the main road with the high traffic. But they have a very beautiful trees. Uh, this is the condition when we visited that the pathway has been degraded, damaged, the trees, some is good condition, some is bad conditions. And in 15 months, we managed to transform this park into a um, something that beyond expectation, we never imagined that uh, it become viral. Everyone in Jakarta and beyond Jakarta want to visit this park. This was taken a few weeks after the park opening. 60,000 people come into this park, equivalent to attending a Coldplay concert, probably. So even they know it's super crowded and it's difficult to find parking space, they have to find parking maybe one to two kilometers away from the park, but they still want to come. So this is Jakarta. I would like to ex explain why, why people want to come here, what makes this park so attracting, and how do we do that? And this has been done during the COVID time period. In 15 months, five months design, eight months construction, two months for tender. So something that is really speed up in terms of process, design thinking, and the design decision, everything. So the, there's a five chapters, five chapters that I'm going to present. Is chapter one is about the context. Jakarta has been reducing the green area significantly through the years. Now it's less than 10%. I think Singapore is much more than that. The size of the Jakarta is similar to Singapore, almost 700 kilometers square, but the population is double the Singapore, 11.2 kilometers. So imagine double the population, less greenery, what kind of life 
you can have in Jakarta. Every day is really about struggle in traffic jam, urbanization. Because Indonesia have a 30 province, everyone want to walk in Jakarta from, from, a, from the village to the university graduate. They all come and stay in Jakarta. And this cause flooding is the main issue in Jakarta. The water sanitation, uh, uh, social issue, pollution, because as there are more people coming to Jakarta to stay there, the, the city become degraded. And the most crucial issue is the social inclusivity. If you go to Jakarta, maybe you see a nice road, big towers, but if you go deeper to the residential area, people live in a kampung, this is the condition. The children don't have a space to play. They play in the road, they celebrate birthday in the road, and they live in the middle of big city. So it's really lacking of a social space for the children. And look at this picture. Almost the entire island is brown color. It's a roof tiles, right? There's no, not much green area. And luckily, we have Tebet Eco Park here that is preserved at the forest city, right at the belly button of Jakarta. It's a 7.3 hectare site, so it's considered a big green area for Jakarta people and surrounded by the very high density residential housing development with apartment, apartment office and schools. So we have three challenges to deal with this park. We deal with multiple stakeholders, just like in Singapore, we deal with a lot with uh, different agency in one projects. We have an uh, environmental agency. The park used to be a garbage dumping site because they don't, there's not much space. So the residents around it throw the rubbish into this park. Look at that pass. And there's a canal managed by the water resource agency. There's a road that's separating the park and the sidewalk on the perimeter and the city forest park by the park agency. The second is the degraded infrastructure condition. The canal has an insufficient capacity, broken side drain, incoming water has been unfiltered, going into the canal directly and throw it to the uh, main rivers and all the broken pathway and social issue at the perimeter of the parks. And because of the low-lying topography, every three to four hours of continuous rain, the park will be flooded and it damages the existing infrastructures and the trees. So our design ethos is really, how can we turn this adversity into the opportunity? We learn about the uh, existing site. As you can see, they have a straight drain. They have a straight pathway. The park is split by the road. This was my initial sketch. How the first thing that we want to repair is the river ecosystem. Turn that straight drain into a meandering rivers. Create a connectivity between the two parks. And the third one, create a program that is contextual to the landscape characters. And it turns out into a blue-green sanctuary with uh, multiple nodes and program for uh, community and different age of people. So this is the design ethos, protecting the trees, creating a river ecology, maximize the path connectivity, and create this program for um, different use according to the landscape characters. We turn this concrete canal. The concrete canal was made from a simple technique of a mixture of concrete and rocks. And we turn it, we break the stone, and use back the stone as part of the bioengineering and replant it with a riparian vegetation. We also do, do the hydrology study, where if you look at the above image, there was the study prior to revitalization. Every 10 hours, years of uh, rainfall events, we be flooded the entire park. We do the simulation. If we renaturalize that, widen the rivers, the flood plain become reduced. We turn the passive gray space from the dry land that frequent flooded become into an active blue-green space. They become a place to watch birds. People can, act, can have an activity around the boardwalk and the playground next to it. So this was the impression that we shown to the governors. Right? By changing the drain into a swales, uh, we can bring back flora and fauna and create more uh, purposeful experience for people come to the park. To change this condition, walking with the site, protect the trees as much as possible. For example, there's a gas station, former gas station over there. We turn it into a playground 
and the river is renaturalized and put the right plant species around it. And also subtle design intervention. We don't want to change too much. We only have five, eight months of construction. So we work closely with what we have, retain the trees and inject the right uh, design at the ground floor level. By doing this approach, we create, we repair the infrastructures and create a multiple program for many uses. In the implementation stage, of course, we have to adapt with the ways of works because this is the first time they do the uh, so-called bioengineering works. They never done this kind of scale project, uh, naturalistic kind of approach. So we have to adapt with the skill of the worker, with the site condition. And what we do is, because of the time constraint, we want to reuse everything that we took out as part of the construction material. So identi identifying the right material, such as the river stone, the broken path, reuse as a compacted pathway and use it as a part of the Gabion wall. Then do a replanting so that because the concrete is removed and the rocks become loose, so we can do a planting. So the result is like this. Just within two or three months construction, we change the canal that used to be like this, become a thriving nature. By doing this, we change the mindset of avoiding reverse, become coming close to the rivers. From man-made intervention, this is the drain that come from the residential. We create the island to protect the trees and become a constructed wetland. And now there's a lot of feces, butterfly, and uh, many animals that come to this small scale of wetlands. This is also the first time the trees were surveyed by, by the local arborists. There's no arborists in Jakarta. So, I have to find the, the right person and they managed to come up with 1,500 trees identifica identification within one month. And this was done parallel when we did a concept design. Survey, concept design at the same time. And with that report, we identify which tree that is good, we try to retain. So the architecture gives way to the trees, the drop off give way to the trees. And the trees that is unhealthy and post safety risk, we reuse that. We work with the local carpenters, turn it into a furniture, turn it into a playground. Look at that cats. So this is about working with time constraint, maximize the site resources, use the local people, and build, uh, recycle, reuse, upcycle, and re reinvent the material that used to be disposed. We reuse that as part of our design. And the design outcome is uh, thriving parks. It was opened in April by the former governor of Jakarta, Anis Baswedan. Currently, he's a, a candidate for the president of Indonesia. And <clears throat> what interesting is the visual identity of the logo. It was captured by the each zones of our design and turned into the infinity loop like the bridge and become part of the uh, branding of the parks. For example, when we won the President Design Award, this is the way they announced the award. <laughs> and it turns into a part of the landscape object, signage, and pathway. And when, when I come to, this, to the park a day after the opening, seven o'clock, the park used to be like that for many years. People just use the park intuitively. And look at the playground, I hope the guy at the trampoline is fine. <laughs> so, uh, a walk in the park journey is really creating the pathway that immerses into various zones. Uh, there's about eight or nine programs. The first time they come, they will arrive at the eucalyptus trees and enjoy the plaza, look at the greenery. There's a lawn for people to do a uh, reading, a uh, shared library. And these are thematic gardens where we design a simple swing and the parents can sit down at a picnic bench and the bridge that is connecting the two parks um, it, it immerse into the existing tree canopies. And the park has been used by the local school. Every morning, you can see the, a lot of students come in and enjoy the park. They learn about the nature, they play the parks, and a lot of people doing the jogging. And, and the, at the top of the page, it doesn't look like you walk in the middle of the 
CTO on, on the streets. It feels like in the forest walk of Singapore. And there's a fitness corners, playground. We create this giant crocodile uh, inspired by Tibet means swamp. In, in swamp means there's a crocodile. And various playground that design locally, not by playground supplier. We, we even work with the local uh, carpenters, peeing decks, and this is inspired by the learning forest, create a hammock around the trees. The difference is used by the cat. So we have a suspension bridge, uh, boardwalks, uh, then the rivers. And we also want to make the parks to be exciting at night time. So we use lighting at the bridge, and it, it's a very beautiful night environment because at night, the trees was light up, everything become red and become a TikTok spot. So, uh, design in VEX, we, we make a groundbreaking design achievement, turning the waters become a floodplains and changing the condition from, from the um, flooded area into a detention area and design for resiliency changing the mindsets from uh, water, soup, water was the burden and now become a burden, the kids playing around the waters and planting a lot of trees, create a new ecosystem, attract a lot of biodiversity that come into the parks and become a social space that raise the quality of life of the local community from all backgrounds. With that, uh, two months ago, I visited the park again for a filming with ABC Gardening Australia. Um, we interview the local residents, the local people that come into the park. This is what they say. Before that, actually, the garden was just like, you know, it's just like plantations and flowers, but now they're starting to build the facilities that is pretty family as well. Kids can play everywhere, and then children can explore. I mean, that's a great concept, especially this Tibet Echo Park. This is our first visit, and we think this is amazing, yeah. In Jakarta, not many parks like this. Yeah. Yeah. So we used to bring to the mall where they can have this kind of playground. But now we can go to this kind of park for free, and they can have another this kind of playground as well. So, as conclusion, as designer, we can get a recognition from awards, from academics, from fellow professional. I think the most important is the recognition from the users because we design for them, and I think. Uh, a good design just simply makes uh, people happy. Thank you. Thank you, Anton, for that very inspiring sharing. Next, for our last Design of the Year project, R for Repair, we have Mr. Hans Tan, founder of Hans Tan Studio. Hans is a designer maker, curator, and associate professor at the National University of Singapore. At his eponymous studio, Hans makes use of beauty and utility as a pretext for visual discourse, tiptoeing the boundaries between design, craft, and art. His work maintains a keen focus on disrupting common things, materials, and fabrication processes, embedding narratives that poke at collective memory, and comment on design and its industry as a phenomenon, especially in the context of heritage, consumption, and waste. As a curator, Hans employs design as a creative and generative catalyst to address cultural and societal challenges or to, or to tackle difficult topics, where the presentation of new possibilities challenges preconceptions and tickles our imagination. Let's welcome Hans to share more. Hans, please. Hello everyone, I'm Hans. Uh, thank you for coming. I feel really privileged to be able to speak to you today. Uh, it was not until Don's introduction that I feel a little bit left out. I thought I was just among friends, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but I'll do my best with this small project that I did three years ago. Alpha Repair is a project that I started in uh, about 2020, uh, and uh, it was a project very, very close to my heart uh, because I've always thought that the you know, we are all familiar with the three R's of sustainability we learn in primary school. And I've always felt that repair is like the forgotten sister or the small brother of the three R's. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, tackling the idea of repair is really interesting if we use creativity to do that instead of just repairing something for the sake of restoration. 
So in uh, 2020, I initiated this project and co-presented the exhibition and a book together with Design Singapore at the National Design Center in early 2021. Uh, as a curatorial piece, this project really investigates the role of repair through design and communicates it to the audience through the exhibition and the book. And I would just really like to uh, acknowledge the team that's been working on this. There are many, many designers that are involved. The core team you know, involved uh, Justin, uh, who was working on the text. Uh, the beautiful photographs and documentation was done by Guo Jie and Edmund Ng. And uh, Gideon and Jamie worked on the graphic design for the exhibition and also for the book design. Uh, just to put this really up front, uh, sustainability is really a big issue, and I always believe that you know, issues pertaining to the broader levels of sustainability is really, really complex, and we really require large-scale systemic solutions and even policies that involves many, many stakeholders that are needed to really shift the tide. Uh, for example, the right for repair movement is gaining ground in the EU, something that you might be aware of, and uh, the British government introduced the right to repair law uh, that went into effect actually in 1st of July 2021 when we launched the exhibition. Uh, and, and this is really to increase producer responsibility in making their products easier to repair. At the same time, you might be familiar with this as well if you use Apple product. In, in November, in the same year, 2021, Apple introduced and announced the self-service repair scheme that allowed more repairers to legitimately repair Apple products. Uh, at the same time, while this is all good, I think R for Repair plays a very special role and plays a part in this conversation of repair by doing two things. Number one, we really wanted to explore repair at a very conceptual level. And number two, we wanted to speak to our relationship with repair at a very personal level. So this informs the underpinnings of the curatorial uh, point of view. And uh, for me, I've always believed that to really look at repair, we really need to transfer our perception of repair as a restorative act to a transformative act. And uh, we really want, through this project, to reimagine the role of repair as an inspiring activity that could lead and produce aspiring outcomes through design. So the curatorial program uh, involved two main parts. I'll just talk about the repair project, the repair objects first before moving to the repair kits. Uh, an open call was done over about three to four days as far as I can remember through social media and we invited the public to volunteer broken, faulty objects. Uh, anyone could submit objects as long as you wrote a small story about it, about why you want the object repaired. And uh, you know, we had a range of objects like a very, very old eye iPod, if I'm not wrong, we had clay pots, uh, glasses, uh, a big singer sewing machine that was all broken down and, uh, and the wood was rotting. Uh, and in the submission form, you know, we also allowed the owners to write stories about the objects that they were volunteering for repair. Uh, at the same time, I shortlisted about 10 uh, designers from Singapore who are based in Singapore, and I paired them with 10 objects that we shortlisted. Uh, and uh, this was really based on their design ethos and their expertise. Uh, I wanted to create a tension between the objects and the designers so that you know, interesting works could come out of this collaboration between the object and the designers and also the owners. These designers came from a wide range of uh, disciplines. Uh, they were from anything from industrial design, graphic design, uh, interaction design, jewelry design. We had a toy designer as well and, and an advertising agency. So they were all given full creative freedom with the permission of the object owners to recreate these objects and to repair these objects creatively. Uh, one of the really important elements that we did was to facilitate conversations between the designers working on the objects and the objects owners. So this was a really interesting move for us because during these conversations, the designers could learn a lot more about each of the stories uh, and the memories behind each of these objects that were broken or torn. And, uh, and these deeper insights gave the designers a lot of ammunition and a meaning to work with. So they were essentially not just repairing the objects per se as tangible things. They were also transforming the stories that came with it. And it was really evident in the repair outcomes that the designers interpreted these narratives in each of these repair concepts. And I'd like to share some with you. Uh, this is a Calvin Klein tote bag that uh, was volunteered by Arno Go. And uh, he bought this with his very first paycheck when he graduated from university. It followed him through many jobs. And uh, after many years of use, it developed a lot of holes uh, and it was very torn and it was relegated into a grocery bag. So what Tiffany, uh, the commission design, for, design repairer for this uh, object, did uh, was really smart because 
she found that surprisingly, the inside of the bag uh, was really well maintained. So what she did was she flipped the bag inside out and the outside became the inside and inside became the outside. So all the holes now were inside and you could not see it anymore. And the inner lining became the outside of the bag, which looked kind of really good. Uh, and you could use it um, maybe for double the lifespan. Uh, but what she did uh, was also uh, to add a mesh cord, as you can see on the right, uh, to strengthen the bag and also to expand its capacity. But at the same time, if you already realize by now, uh, it drew connections to the ubiquitous mesh grocery bags that we might be quite familiar with. Uh, next, we had a pair of really faded moving tickets volunteered by a very young, cute couple. Uh, it was from their first date. I'm not sure you can make up from the tickets on the right. They're really faded, right? It was for the amazing Spider-Man. So the, the movie was a really big deal for this couple because their first date and they're all they are both uh, uh, introverts. Uh, so they kept an album of all their dates and this was the very first one. And uh, what Jonathan Yen, the commission designed for this project, uh, did was uh, he thought that you know uh, he didn't want to reinstate the piece per se or the, the tickets that was really uh, uh, faded, but he felt that it was really important to preserve the faded tickets as evidence of the beauty of time passing in their relationship. So uh, what he did was he designed uh, and uh, made a, a thoughtfully created augmented reality filter where the owners using their phones could use uh, an app and they are able to hover over the tickets and to see it in its mint restored condition, uh, but when they don't use the app, it still appears really, really faded. Uh, so when, it, you know, I would imagine that when they see it for the, when they see the tickets restored, you know, it was as if they were holding the tickets for the first time when they had their first date. It was really interesting also, and I've not reviewed this in any presentations, that uh, when we paired the designer to the object, we found out that one of the object owners, uh, the guy, uh, was actually a student in graphic design, and one of his heroes was Jonathan Yuan. Uh, next up, we had a, a, a ankle bracelet, which was uh, volunteered by Yan Li. Uh, as you know, in most Asian and Chinese families, when you're you, like a baby, uh, your parents will tie a gold bracelet around your uh, one of your feet. That's quite a common thing to do uh, uh, in many cultures. That's Asian as well, and. Uh, she, and Yen kept this bracelet with her for many, many years because she treasured uh, it being given to by her father and her mother, and it broke when she grew out of it. Uh, so what this piece of uh, work was repaired was uh, they were repaired by uh, state property. I think they happened to have a shop nearby, near Pranaka Museum actually. And uh, what they did was really meaningful uh, because uh, they took the, the the teddy bear that was broken and cast it into a gold piece and inserted a diamond into the heart of the bear to symbolize how precious this piece of jewelry is to the owner. And at the same time, when you connect all the new restored bears together, it fit the wrist size of the owner and she could use it all over again. Uh, this was a pair of spectacles, as you can see on the right, uh, donated by Min Jong. She just relocated to Singapore. She's from Korea. And uh, the pair of spectacles that she really loved was destroyed by her young daughter. Uh, she tried to repair it very unsuccessfully using the orange paste. As you can see, you might be able to see it here clearer. So uh, this was Kinetic's interpretation of the repair. And uh, instead of working on the glasses, uh, halfway through the project, they asked me for 3D scans of the owner's head. I was like, oh, what in the world are you doing? And uh, what they did was really interesting because uh, uh, with the 3D scans of the owner's head, they... 3D printed and built the head and the torso of the owner and adjusted her head to fit the wayward spectacles instead. So she, they didn't repair the spectacles, they repaired the owner's head. <laughs> I thought that this piece of work, although it's quite uh, conceptual and pushes the boundaries, but it really captured the spirit of the whole R4 Repair project because it really challenged our ideas of repair. And sometimes, perhaps it's not the repairs that require, it's not the objects that require repair, perhaps it's our perception, our perspective, that requires a little bit of repairing as well. So this project culminated in about 10 uh, repair uh, products, and uh, I don't have time to go through all of them as much as I wish to, uh, but I'd just like to talk a little bit of the repair kits as well that made up the exhibition. So these repair kits were uh, done in the design studio I led at the National University of Singapore. These students were from the Department of Industrial Design, and the brief to them was to design a process of repair, 
not a repair object or to repair an object, but design a unique process of repair, a novel technique of repair that goes beyond reinstating the utility of an everyday object. So the outcome must be better off than the previous uh, uh, object where it's broken, and the technique must be contained in a very small kit and be mass producible. And with simple instructions, any layman should be able to use it. Uh, the students came up with really interesting uh, fas and fascinating outcome. Uh, one of the groups was uh, a group that came up with a kit uh, that you're able to seal the holes and tears on your shoe by painting over them. They discovered that you could paint with uh, a special rubber that cured in room temperature. And just by provi providing masking stickers, or you could do it freehand yourself, you could paint over tears and holes. Uh, and they last for pretty long. Uh, there was also a kit where you can personalize a very small piece of decorative work that will cover those ugly exposed wall plug you know, on the wall that sometimes you, know, you didn't care to plaster over. And also, uh, this group of students manipulated a soldering iron and made customized tips so that you could repair uh, plastics products made of thermoplastics yeah, through plastic welding. And with the different types of tips, you could actually choose the patterns that you want to engrave or weld the plastics with. So with these uh, repair kits, uh, uh, in this exhibition that we made, it was made during uh, the pandemic season. So COVID was running high. And uh, the funny thing was, although all the workshops were all closed down and we couldn't run any workshops, which we in initially thought we wanted to, uh, we discovered that we could actually post these kits uh, just by post to participants. So we conducted uh, four fully subscribed workshops over two weekends. And the students were running this workshop and instructing and teaching the participants how to repair the objects at home when they receive these kits. So these two, the repair kits together with the repair objects came together as the content of the exhibition. And in the spirit of alpha repair, we did the exhibition design as well. We wanted to design exhibitions very responsibly because it's quite common for exhibitions to generate a lot, a lot of waste. So other than the vinyls on the wall that you see, uh, no adhesive, no paints, uh, zero on-site construction was done for the exhibition setup. All the graphic elements, the text elements, were held down with magnets on the, on the pieces of uh, display furniture. And each exhibition display module was deliberately designed for an afterlife as a site table, composing of a fiber drum produced by a company in Singapore and galvanized steel surface held down by its own weight. So we had a adopt a table public call towards the end of the exhibition. Within seven hours, all 70 tables were fully booked. Uh, so effectively, on the last day of the exhibition, right, all the table adopters came to the exhibition and collected their, their tables, and they essentially became our teardown team. So we spent zero dollars on teardown. Uh, they, some of them even bought some of the acrylic, all our acrylic cases they were used to cover the works. And in 2022, I was very, very thrilled that the success of this project led to a second edition of Alpha Repair. It was a collaboration between London and Singapore, and I co-curated this exhibition with a uh, a very prominent uh, curator called Jane Withers in the UK. So using the same format, we had objects this time from both Singapore and also in uh, the UK, and we have designers commissioned from both Singapore and the UK. As you can see on the top, you have the puffin with the very broken wing. Uh, it was broken by the owner's cat, and uh, what seeing the designer who repaired this object was to really cover the broken wing with a uh, weave woven rattan. And in fact, if you can see the Puffin also has a new belt and a small bag with a small message that tells the owner to take care of it better. We had a very special object as well. Uh, two special ones. We had an 18th century uh, uh, Victorian cabinet, as you can see on the top. Uh, but on the top right, uh, we have a plate from Maxime's de Paris. Uh, this plate was actually donated or volunteered by Andrew Birkin, the English screenwriter, and uh, with his wife, Karen Birkin. Uh, Andrew Birkin is the brother of Jane, the late Jane Birkin, the actress and the singer, uh, which the Birkin bag is named after. So she stole this plate, she pinched this plate, as we call it politely in English, uh, from uh, the, the restaurant that she always frequents and passed it on to the brother. And uh, it was one of the plates were broken uh, in his possession and he volunteered this plate to be repaired by a studio dumb. You know, I, I hope to have the, have the time to run through all these really, really fascinating repair projects. Uh, the, the, the projects were all, in this case, in the second exhibition, held at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and it ended last November in 2022. So uh, not only did this 
project bring the message to a wider audience. It was done at the world's leading museum of art and design. It became a platform also to show local design talent. So if you want to learn more about these different projects, the background of these projects, and how these projects were repaired, do visit the R4 Repair website. Thank you. Thank you, Hans, for that wonderful sharing. We will now invite our last speaker for today's forum. He is none other than Designer of the Year, Mr. Leonard Ng Kyok Po, Country Market Director for Henning Larson APEC. Leonard's academic background and design interest lies at the juncture between mankind and its environment, with the aim of finding a long-term sustainable balance between them. His approach involves extensive collaboration with diverse professions to foment holistic landscape-based solutions that engage and educate users while respecting the environment. His recent works include design that integrates the water found on site with the surrounding urban development in a sensitive manner. Recent project awards include the International Federation of Landscape Architecture Asia Pacific Award for Outstanding Award in Parks and Open Space for the Jurong Lake Gardens 2021, the President's Design Award, Design of the Year for Kampong Admiralty 2020, and the International Federation of Landscape Archi Architecture AAPME Award for Outstanding Award for the Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve in 2018. Without further ado, let's put our hands together and welcome Design of the Year Leonard to share about his practice. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, before I start my uh, lecture proper, I first like to congratulate all my fellow winners. All right, uh, really inspired by your work uh, and and look for many more years of uh, good outcome from you. Secondly, I'd like to thank uh, uh, my fellow collaborators and my team members who are here and today. Some of them are here today. Uh, industry partners uh, and uh, fellow designers have collaborated on many projects. Has been very accepting of our design. Uh, some of our clients here who were prepared to experiment with uh, designs that have not proven, uh, uh, even though the outcome was not certain, right? And uh, finally, my family who's not here today. Uh, without all of you, this journey would not have been possible. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I, I'll start my uh, lecture with this. Uh, who do you want to be? This is a question that a lot of us ask ourselves mostly at important inflection points in our lives, right? Where we are, we are possibly where we're not happy what we're doing or we are searching for a new opportunity. So I ask, my, I ask myself this several times in my life. One time was this, in 1987. I'm not sure how many of you will recognize this movie. This probably, you know, predates a lot of your, your, your time, but... Uh, I was I just graduated from university then. It was 1987, I came back with a newly minted uh, finance degree and I saw this movie. And I wanted to be that guy, Charlie Sheen. Unfortunately, I don't share his looks, but I share his passion. Right? I share his passion to be a big dealer in Wall Street. I didn't make it Wall Street, but I made it to be a trader. So I, I worked for 15 years in a bank, right? Head of proprietary trading for bonds and futures uh, and worked in Singapore, actually worked in London. It was really good 15 years, right? But I realized towards the end of that career that you know this was not a career you can retire with. I needed to look for something more sustainable, right? And I realized through trying different things I realized I wanted to do something that could make a difference to people's life. I was in a, I was in this profession that benefited the banks and the shareholders, right? My effort was reflected in the plus and minus column of the ledger every year. There was no goodwill. I started from zero every other year. So. So that got me thinking, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? Who do I want to be? So this is a, a really nice sentence by Will Durant. To give life a meaning, one must have a purpose larger than life. Which is not to say that my previous banking job was not purposeful. It played a role, right? 
You do it for your family, you do it for your friends, you do it for your team, you do it for your country. Everybody has got your reasons. They're all valid, right? But what, what he is saying is, if you've got purpose within yourself, then it makes your, 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 your effort noble. And there are many purpose out there that requires attention. You see this on a daily basis in news. I mean, you have seen this today. And this, we are experiencing this, we are right in the midst of a heat wave. All of this requires attention, effort, and passionate personnel to pursue this. And you know, increasingly, as we confront, you know, what humanity has done to the environment, I, I realized that I want to make a difference. And therefore, I wanted to become a landscape architect. So I thought that's not entirely true. I, I, I need to be honest with you. Actually, I wanted to become an architect. I knew that would happen, but the truth is, at a point in time, I was 38 years old. I was well into my first career. I was looking to start the second career, and it was a lot to give up. One day, I was head of proprietary trading in the bank, right, running a team of traders. The next day, or the next week, I was an intern in NPARKS. The runway to be an architect, to be a QP, is much longer than an architect. So I took the easy way out. I became a landscape architect. But I must say, after having been in this business for a while now, I don't regret it. I don't regret it because of the people I've met, the things I've seen, and the things I've done. Let's talk about being a landscape architect. Okay, landscape architecture itself, right, ha carries with it some baggage, some misconceptions, right? For the longest time, my kids thought that I was just a glorified gardener, which is actually true in the way landscape architecture is practiced in many areas and how landscape architects are regarded by many fellow disciplines, right? So I, I see myself as an uh, advocate and an act activist for the profession too. I want to I change the perception. I want to change it because I feel that there's a much bigger role we can play. Right? So I see myself as a champion for nature. How do you bring the best, show the best of nature to the design interventions you do? And you don't have to do much. You can do the little bit, and nature will take care of itself. So we try to do that in every single project. We, you know, for example, recycling tree logs as little play elements. Little gestures like that makes a difference to people how, how people experience the space. I see ourselves as ecosystem thinkers. We increasingly we cannot work in isolation. Uh, very few disciplines right, can conduct their business without the contribution of other disciplines. Right? We are all interconnected. And we need to understand what our fellow designers are doing in order to bring out the best in yourself. Right? For example, how do we integrate water systems in the buildings and landscape so that they conceive as one system? And finally, I see yourself as storytellers. I just had a conversation out in the meeting room just now and somebody was saying, ah, you know, we are losing memories of the space, right? Our relation to the space is becoming more tenuous because what we remember is gone. And we need to create new narratives in our, in our, in our uh, physical space. We need to build opportunities for memories so that it doesn't have to be beautiful but it has to be a space where you remember for the right reasons. Any space is an opportunity to create memories. It's really up to your imagination. 
So now I'm going to run through the projects. Uh, actually, the, these four projects I'm going to show you uh, won the uh, President's Design Award. I wanted to show you because it, has an, it, it demonstrates an evolution of my design and how, how uh, I was trying to embed my philosophy into, uh, into these uh, design solutions. So this was my very first project after I graduated from uh, university. Uh, and this is New Majestic Hotel, right? It was a really simple intervention. They, uh, the owner had this little sliver of land that actually didn't belong to him in front of the hotel. And he was trying to convince the authorities to give it to him to, so that he can do something for, uh, for the community. Then he approached me and says, hey, what can you do with this sliver of land? The problem with this sliver of land is it was really tiny. It was like a thousand square feet. And then there were high tension cables running underneath. So I can't do anything below. It has all to be resting on the ground. So the idea was to create this series of me uh, ribbons that meander and form a landscape. So I devised this series of pots that looks like if you put them together, look at a series of ribbons. You just place them on top of the ground and make it into a simple landscape that looks like it's part of the ground, but actually pots. It's no longer there, right? Uh, and I don't regret, but when it was there, it was well used. People were sitting on it, the kids running up and down the ribbons, right? And it, it, it provided a beautiful backdrop. And even though it's a small little pocket park, it provided a backdrop for the community there. The next project that I was involved in was part of the team for Bishan Amilko Park. So uh, we were then called Italia Dry Saddle, and uh, <clears throat> PUB was unbocking, embarking on this program called uh, ABC Waters, right? Uh, and ABC Waters was really not about beautifying rivers. It really was about changing mindsets. And why were they wanting to change mindsets? It had to do with uh, uh, our need to protect water as a resource. You know, Singapore has a limited land area. We had to rely on imported water, right? But that's not sustainable. So one of the programs was to increase the catchment of water, right? But water is only useful if it is clean and doesn't require too much resources or energy to make it usable. So the whole idea is, look, now that we have demonstrated that uh, it's possible to clean Singapore River, let's impound all the rivers Right, collect all the water and recycle them as drinking water. And they want to do it for all the catchments. And this is one of the catchments, right? So the idea was when it rains, you catch it, you clean it, you beautify it, you use it to activate the space. And with that beautiful space, people will use it, they'll build memories, and then they are less likely to litter and pollute. They take ownership of the space. So it went from this. No, the canal being a separator of community and uh, where they play. We use nature-based solutions, right, to replace the concrete. And this was the result, right? I mean, the, uh, the, the, the advantage of having this as opposed to a canal, I think it's obvious, right, to nature, to man, and for your well-being. We use the native uh, uh, lands uh, landscape material to create beautiful landscapes. And we, we actually devise a landscape uh, strategy that allows uh, natural ev evolution of, of, of plants, native plants, so that they are not fixed in a place. They evolve over time. And really, we want to create a space that respects nature, provides space for nature to coexist harmoniously so that we can build memories for the future, right? And with this, we hope that people will learn to treasure water as a resource, understand the value of design. So to me, this was probably the most satisfying part of the entire design. So this was during after a storm event, right? And there were members of public 
writing in a forum, right, explaining the purpose of the design to other members they felt were ignorant. They says, look, this is not flat, this is planned, right? And to me, that validates that actually now you have a buy-in, now you can step back and let the public play its role. The next project that we run, uh, PDA4, was Jurong Eco Garden. And this was actually an industrial park, right? Uh, but it was non-existent. There was actually, it looks like a verdant forest, really thick, really beautiful, right? Uh, and they wanted to develop a plot at the time. So we went in there and proposed that maybe you should create the green and blue infrastructure first, right? So that then you use that as an, uh, as an inducement for the developers to come in. But when we went in there and investigated and started digging in, we found that it had meters of garbage under the green. Actually, it was a dump site for many, many, many decades. So one of the strategy was, okay, you know, let's, with this green infrastructure, use water right, as a strategy to remediate all these pollutants leach them out of the soil, treat them before it's discharged right, into the public space. And a simple gesture of just including water courses in a really aesthetic manner, having them treated right, in a bioretention, uh, bioremediation bed, right, and integrate really seamlessly with the surroundings. The last project that won this is the Campo Emeraldi which uh, we worked with Wohar. They are the lead architect on this. And we're the landscape architects. And we wanted to create an elevated ground, ground plane, right, to bind communities. Because, you know, when you live in flats, the ground plane is very far from you. How do you create this new elevated ground, ground plane? And this project would not have been pos possible without a close collaboration with all the different disciplines. You cannot get a picture like this, right? If you invite, as an architect, if you invite a landscape architect, after you have done your building, it is not possible because you need to embed waterproofing, you need to embed irrigation, you need to provide for loading, you need to do all those things. And we embedded water systems throughout, fully recycling systems of irrigation. This was the image uh, during construction. You notice all the hard roofs and the senior citizens who are living in the tower blocks will be looking at this. One year later, this is what they got. A beautiful landscape hillside. And you know, it makes an entire a difference to your, to your life. This is a new project that opened a couple of years ago, Jurong Ecosystem. We wanted to recreate lowland freshwater swamp that used to be found there in Jurong, right? But it was really, now we went beyond creating spaces for humans. We wanted to also provide for nature as stakeholders, right? We looked at what was there, the gray herons, and we provided spaces for them. We created islands for them to make them feel secure. And we also pro provide feeding zones by creating these mud flats. But we allow people to, to uh, interact with them, but from a distance, right? So people cannot get down to where they are feeding, but can view from afar. So, this was a rendering we done during competition stage. And this was a video we, to, uh, we took just before opening. And that image of the bird flying in the sky, that was the image we wanted to create. So now it's a space that uh, you know is really welcoming, and I I uh, I was told that uh, it was it was really a welcome relief during the COVID nineteen, right? It was it was actually not viewed as a luxury; it was viewed as a necessity, right? And and this is really where the storytelling comes in, you know, where you build memories, right? Where people come back to again and again. And this is actually we pulled this out from Instagram. It's actually not Japan, this is Singapore. This is Jurong Lake Gardens. 
So I end by saying, what next? Right? Uh, there's still a lot more to do. There's still a lot more potential to this uh, um, profession and the collaboration with our fellow uh, uh, pro, uh, design professionals. So this project right now we're dealing, doing for uh, Singapore Food Agency, which is a Lim Chu Kang master, Fruit Master Plan. Uh, food resilience is becoming a really hot topic. Uh, how do we combine food production with coastal defense, with climate change, with biodiversity, right? with uh, uh, limited water resources? These are topics that need to be explored. Right? We, are explore, we are also exploring new ways to play. You know, now the kids have got you know, options. Yeah, they've got virtual options. My kids are constantly on, a, on PlayStations. How do we entice them uh, into the physical world? Climate change, heat island effect, you know, exploring how do we improve our uh, thermal comfort is another big topic. And finally, the health of our oceans and our seas, right? So this, I, I think is really important, not just me, but for everyone else in this room to ask your, yourself this question. How can you make a difference? Thank you. Thank you, Leonard, for that very inspiring presentation. Um, actually, Leonard, could you please take a seat in the front? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope everyone found the sharing by all the speakers insightful. We will now move on to the Q&A segment. I invite the rest of the panel members to please join Leonard at the, at the seats in the front. Yeah. Okay. Moderating the session is Ms. Wong Renting. Renting is a designer specializing in interiors and landscape architecture. She works as a project designer at Rios, an international design collective. With a transdisciplinary approach, she combines her education in architecture and landscape archi architecture with professional experience in interior design to drive innovation and create unique designs. Alongside her role at Rios, she teaches part-time at the Department of Architecture, National University of Singapore, inspiring and mentoring aspiring designers while bridging academia and practice. Run Ting continues to contribute to the design community through her active involvement in organizations like the Singapore Institute of Landscape Architects and the Landscape Industry Association Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, the panel is ready. Please take this opportunity to ask any questions that you might have. You may scan the QR code shown on the screen to submit your questions, and we will also take questions from the floor if there, if there are any. I'll now hand over the mic to Run Ting to begin the segment. Yep. Right. So uh, as you guys are slowly typing furiously your questions into the thing, I think I will start off with the first question. So um, I think Hongwei and Hans did something. What I loved is where they showed their slide and they showed the number of people who are involved in the different projects and that it takes, uh, it's not just a sort of a solo designer who runs these amazing things you see, but it's a multidisciplinary team. So I guess this is a question that I'll ask all four of them, but maybe we start with Hong Wei. Um, how, um, how is a multidisciplinary approach valuable when designing with sustainability in mind? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, coming specifically from uh, the Singapore Pavilion perspective, um, what we did was we wore actually uh, wore two hats. We are the architects as well as the creative director, um, and and it's a unique project because it goes beyond uh, uh, architecture itself, and I think we also have to work seamlessly with the entire team to bring the pavilion together and up. And uh, I think learning through and getting to know um, different creative minds, right from operations, from management, from F&B, retail, uh, to engineering, um, it's, it's important to be able to collaborate and to work together as a team because the sum is definitely more than the parts. Right? So I, I think it has been a very meaningful and productive journey. Uh, it's, it took longer. Uh, than what we expected. Um, but I think the outcome is something that we are all very proud of. Um, in fact, I think we, 
were we had many sleepless nights, especially the, in the months uh, uh, leading towards the opening, because you now we really want to make this a uh, good product uh, from Singapore. Thank you for that. Um, Hans, you want to try and take a stab at, at how maybe you embrace multidisciplinary approach in your day-to-day -day practice? <laughs> There you go, this works, right? Okay, uh, maybe I start answering question in the context of the project Alpha Repair. Uh, to be honest, Alpha Repair was quite straightforward, although I was working with uh, 10 designers from different fields of design, uh, also with a team that was in charge of putting the exhibition together. Uh, it, was, it wasn't difficult because uh, the design industry in Singapore is quite small. I knew all the designers personally, uh, so they didn't have much choice but to deliver what they promised. Uh, uh, but besides the point is uh, we did a project at the height of COVID. So uh, one of the reasons why I thought it was really interesting to launch the project was because uh, it was a time where all the projects were starting to be cancelled. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted to breathe life into that season, to breathe creativity in a season where projects are starting to diminish yeah, and to launch it where the COVID was starting to alleviate and to bring visitors back to the National Design Center. So this was one of the first exhibition uh, at, at the Design Center after, the, uh, after people were allowed to visit exhibitions. So for me, that is really important. Uh, apart from this project, in my personal design studio, I do work alone. So I am that lone designer that you just described. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Oh, so, no. so I work on a very individual basis, yeah. uh, but uh, the way I work as a curator is to bring different elements uh, together, uh, not as a company working together, but you know, as collaborators working together. So every project I work with, I work with a set of different uh, collaborators depending on the need and the nature of the project. Thank you for that. Nana, did you want to add? Sure. Uh, I, I think it's critical. For the type of projects we do, it is so complex that uh, not, uh, no single person has got all the required knowledge. For example, you know, um, take out Bishan Park. You need a hydraulic engineer, right? Yeah, you need landscape architects, you need ecologists, uh, you need uh, architects, you need everybody in order to tap on the different skill set, right? So that the outcome is integrated, right? And is multifunctional in its approach. So uh, if you seek a, a, a holistic uh, a approach that really solves problems at multiple levels, then you really need to go uh, multifunctional and uh, integrated. Yeah, I, I think um, to work as a collaborator, it's also important for us to understand what are the provision uh, um, backgrounds, right? We, we, it's not just that we learn and strengthen our own skill, but also to learn from other profession practice, right? First of all, if, if I'm a landscape architect, I have to know what is the mind of architects, what is the engineer's behaviors, mm -hmm. and then we can communicate better. Okay. No, that's great. Um, so I had a, fault, a question just so that Anton, since you are here with the mic, um, so you spoke about reinvention, right? Turning adversity into opportunity, setbacks into comebacks. And I wanted to reflect on this but also to also relate this to how you mentioned that you were working on a super compressed timeline, which I think for many of us who are in the industry, we are completely familiar with this sort of constraint. So I want to know how did you transform that constraint that in a way it's a setback to work with such a tight timeline into an opportunity? Well, yeah, uh, when, when we were get the projects we were tasked by the gover by the uh, governments finish it in one year 12 months design I, I thought it's just design but he said construction not design I said it's impossible we never done this in singapore right one month to finish a project uh, even they don't have a topography plan so it was super challenging and i asked myself whether it's possible but in the end we don't want to miss the opportunity we took the job and as we started, I think it's the power of, and it was during the COVID time, I couldn't travel to Jakarta. Everyone was working remotely, right? Um, it was the power of 
visionary leaders, of course, from the stakeholders, they think they can, then they have to pull everyone. So everyone has to be in the same basket. By bringing people together, everyone has to support each other, decision has to be made faster. So from the design, from the consultants, from the stakeholders, they have to say yes, but of course you, have to, you need to have a good design. So I was thinking, if a project can be done in short time, it's, the, it's benefit for everyone. From stakeholders, you save a lot of time. And the most benefit is the users, right? The community, they can see the changes. Maybe we prepare this precedent design award for 12 months, right? But that 12 months can be transformed into new parks that has been uh, attracting so many millions of people has come to the park. And I think it's really about the drive from the team members and working with the constraint, it brings out your uh, creativity and the adrenaline to succeed uh, in everything that you do. Well, thank you, thank you for that. Um, do any of you guys want to comment or add to that? Share similar anecdotes of working in super compressed timelines? <laughs> Okay, no. Um, so then I will pick up on the last point that you that you also made, but I think also let it made. It's about the the importance of the user recognition and designing um, for people. I think you mentioned social inclusivity, um, and so I guess this is a question for all four of you: um, is how do you actively seek to learn from users in your practice, um, or and maybe to add to that. Um, Maybe you can speak of an instance where your views or your process as the designer has changed as a result of engagement um, with user, either through feedback or even if it's through those facilitated conversations um, that came purposefully in the process. So maybe Hong Wei, you've been quiet. I'll start with you. <laughs> right. Um, how do we engage and how, how do we learn, right? Um, not not specific to the Singapore Pavilion, but I think as a practice, uh, we do want to know how our buildings, our design performs, and and definitely when you measure something, you can improve on that, right? So I think um, we are always interested in how our building performs, and how the building can be productive and regenerative, productive in the sense that how how it enables uh, people to be happy or how it enables our uh, ecosystem services. So these are all measurable. And I think once you measure them and by taking in feedback, by looking at social media on what are the comments are, what's valuable to the people, uh, to the stakeholders, to the occupants. And I think then you, you take it through uh, and, and see what else you can do for the next project. Um. I think uh, as designers, most of you will probably agree that you know it never ends, right? You're always con designing, trying to improve it to the very last moment. But even after you send in the tender documents, you still think about how you can improve it, right? Even after you build it, you're still thinking about how you improve it. So every step of the way, having feedback is really important uh, because if it doesn't fit into this particular project, it fits in a future project. Uh, and, and that's how we see our practice, right? You're constantly striving to improve. Um, and feedback is critical. Uh, and for me, maybe in design, especially in product industrial design, we often associate you being user-centered as a very important thing, and I really agree with that. Uh, more often than not, we associate user-centered design with use, uh, with performance, uh, and also uh, uh, with utility. Uh, at the same time, uh, and, I, I, and I also learned a lot from Leonard's uh, presentation today, that stories and meanings are also part of people's use. And it defines who we are and our experiences with things. So these are things that we can also look into. And that is something that we tried to tackle in the R4 Repair project. Uh, one could have easily given objects to designers to create them, uh, to interpret them creatively in terms of how they want to repair. But the story component related to this object was really the pinnacle of what we were wanting to transform instead. And I think that worked out to some extent quite successfully uh, with the designers really incorporating them into the interpretations at the end. Further to that, um, from um, the Singapore Pavilion experience, I think what, what was important to us is that, if I can borrow a saying, is that people will forget uh, what you tell them, people will forget what you show them. 
but people will not forget how you make them feel, right? So I think that was something that we wanted to do to really uh, take a step back, create a different environment, uh, create a respite from the rest of the uh, expo ground and to make them feel that they enjoy the space, they get connected with nature. And I, I think throughout the process, uh, even post uh, expo, we have been getting good feedbacks from medias. And, and there were a lot of coverage uh, on, on the pavilion on, online. And, and that was something that was, uh, we, we take away from in terms of what we tried to do, uh, how we represent Singapore. And uh, it also pushes us to see what else we can do further in our more, uh, future projects. Yeah, I think involvement of uh, users is very important. For example, in Turbot Eco Park, before we build the parks, uh, the government arranged a focus group discussion. It involved everyone stay around the Turbots, from the uh, governments to the local residents, to give the feedback, what do they want for the parks. And that is listed in... Um, written documents. Some said, uh, I, was a, I want a fish pond, I want a beautiful river, I don't want the garbage, right? And with all those decisions, we, we tabulate and we use as a reference for our design. No point if we design something like in Singapore, but it's not adaptable, it's not useful in, in Jakarta. So we have to know what is the context. And other than Tabat Ecopa, I think uh, there's a two things that we need to negotiate. And the art of negotiation is important also in our job, right? Uh, um, Stakeholders have a budget, right? Users have this demand. So it's, as a designer, it's really about how to bridge these two needs. Especially if you work on the private sector project, it's much more difficult. Yeah, if you want to serve a community with certain budgets, so we need to find that uh, middle ground uh, as designers to accommodate all the users' needs. I'd like to add by, you know, I think a user played an important role as keeping designers real. Right. Sometimes designers think, oh, I got it all figured out. I know exactly how they're going to use this. All right. And then I design the playground and I go to the playground and I see the kids hanging off the rails as though, oh, shit. I never imagined that will happen. Right. And, and at the end of the day, it's how they use it uh, through their own experience, how they view your, your design through the lens of their, uh, 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 their, their needs. That's the one that's going to make a real impact on them. And, and, and we all should be open to the idea that, you know, uh, that uh, what we have intended may not be how they use it, and we must be prepared to change. Okay. Well, Leonard, since you have the mic, <laughs> there, there are, I think, uh, two, two questions that uh, have come in that I think are interrelated and that they're, um, they're directed to you. So I think they're, uh, the two questions are related in the sense, the question asks, um, how and where did you find the courage to move away from your... 15 years well-established banking career to start completely fresh. Maybe there are people contemplating the same thing right now. Um, and, and in the same vein, as, as when, you, when you did that pivot, how did you um, so quickly rise to the top, so to say, to lead um, the studio? <laughs> I get asked that a lot. And I need to correct that misconception. First off, there was no courage. There was a lot of fear, mm. right? And there was a lot of uncertainty, right? And the transition wasn't fast. It was slow. Right? It took a long time to climb up. Mm. So, but, you know, you come to a point in life where, as I said, you know, you, 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 at that point in my life at least, I was beginning to question, what am I doing, right? There was, you know, if you have problems waking up in the morning going to work, then you need to ask yourself that question. What will get you out of bed, right? And, and I think I was at that point. I, I was seeing friends in the training department burn out, right? Really down. And, and I, I didn't want that to happen to myself. I, I, I didn't want to be told that I'm going to be laid off, right? I want to leave on my own terms, right? But I, I realized that because of the changing economy and new economy, Right? It's very difficult to have a career that lasts you your entire lifetime. Right? So inevitably, for most of you, there will be a change. Right? And, and, and it, it's going to be a difficult question, and it depends on personal experience. Right? It's easier if you've got no obligations. It's a lot more difficult if you've got, ob you've got obligations. Right? But nonetheless, you, know, you need to come to your own terms. 
You need to be real and you need to be honest with yourself. Well done. <laughs> Um, so now I think there are some questions that are quite specific to the project, and I guess we we, we can go through them. So I think we, starting with the with the Singapore uh, Pavilion, um, we always like to know they want to know what are the key challenges faced. Uh, how did the team, you know, how long did it ta take to conceptualize the design to construct it? Uh, how long did that did that take? And then the cost, if that is possible to share. <laughs> The cost. <laughs> um, how long did it take? It was a design competition uh, that we got us uh, involved in uh, in this uh, project. Um, it took longer than expected because of COVID. There was a big uh, curveball that was thrown along the way. Um, up, upstream, I think um, the design took less than a year. I mean, we are clear in what we wanted. Uh, we, the simple idea was to create an oasis in the desert. That was what we put in, in our submission. But we know it's uh, never simple to be simple, right? Um, you have to hold on to that singular idea and, and make sure everybody fall in line in terms of the delivery, uh, where the touch points are or when we tell the story. So, so that was something that uh, we, uh, along the way, had to hold a fort and uh, make sure that it's uh, delivered uh, as per what we have promised uh, in the submission. Uh, it's also an oasis for the census, uh, in, a, in the sense that we wanted to uh, create a space that offers respite from the information overload from the expo. I'm not sure anyone has been there, but you know, going through 190 country pavilions, I'm sure you know, you'll get tired out. So um, what we did was to really offer a space of a garden where the guests are intuitively drawn into uh, to escape from um, the hustle and bustle, right? So that was something that uh, we um, rigorously tried to make sure that happened. Cost. Cost, no, I can't review that. <laughs> I, I tried, I tried. <laughs> um, so for, for Anton, regarding the park, I think the, uh, there's a question also on the more sort of understanding the nitty gritty. Um, what were the authority submissions sub, uh, required in Jakarta, maybe I guess in comparison to here, uh, and the timelines required to get the approvals before construction? Yeah, <laughs> bring me back to a really <laughs> a rare memories. Uh, there's no beam submission yet in Jakarta and everything is done <laughs> manual. Right, <laughs> so we had to bring the papers, hard copies, go there, and they 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 do a marking directly. Maybe just like in Singapore, maybe twenty years ago, yeah, we we do a man <laughs> manual submission. <laughs> so it was done, and and we have a four stakeholders involved, right? Just like the LTA, BUB, and Parks equivalent in Jakarta. So we had to go through one by one. So it's almost like weekly submission because they want it to be constructed fast. But we also need a approval record, right? So everything has to be done separately. We have a three or four teams engage four different stakeholders. So it was a rush project, but they also, because it's a government project, they also understand the graffiti that this is mandated from the governor. So they have they pay attention fully also to to get it done and approved also. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so Hans, uh, there is a question here for you. Uh, in terms of the R for repair, um, how did the collaboration with VNA happen? Uh, was it was it did that happen organically? Was it planned from the from the beginning? So um, and has the sort of the message of the exhibition game on traction in Singapore after it went overseas to London? Uh, when we did the first edition in Singapore, uh, we did it at the National Design Centre. Mm. Uh, what we were really surprised is the amount of uh, uh, attention it got, especially in the overseas media and also in the local media. And it was really well recognised by a lot of design magazines, blogs and books that were publishing uh, articles about the exhibition. I think that was one of the catalysts of thinking about uh, doing the second edition. Uh, I have to give credit to Design Singapore, who really was, who was really visionary in, think, in thinking about collaborating for a second edition and bringing the concept uh, to the wider audience. Uh, so we were looking for countries, different countries to collaborate with. Uh, 
I could say this now. Uh, I didn't really want to do it actually because there was so much work. Uh, so I gave them a very very difficult task. Okay, if you if we do it, if VNA wants to do it, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it was VNA and the Design Museum in the UK, very specifically. If we manage to get them on board, I'll do it. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, it was a serendipity. After serendipity, the people knew each other, and somehow we got word, uh, and we got to know the curators uh, and uh, of some of the galleries at the museum. And uh, when we presented the concept to them together with Design Singapore, they told us yes, and they told us that it was the first time they said yes in the meeting that they saw a concept for the first time. Uh, so for us, that that was that was uh, that really vindicated all our efforts that we put in finding yeah, a partner to do the second edition and also how the first edition was really impacting the people who saw it. Um, so as please send in more questions um, as we are that's developing. I actually had a question uh, for you, Hans, in regards to your um, so for R for repair. I like what you said. It was it's a, sort of the forgotten sister of the three R's: reduce, recycle, um, reuse. That whole mantra with sustainability. Um, and in a way, repair, you could see it's part of that antidote to the obsolescence that is generally generated by consumerism. So just, just something to pose, not to put you on, this, on the spot, but had you ever considered how you would, if you had the opportunity to extend that same aspiration, but on a different scale, so that if it wasn't a product, material, physical scale, um, no budgets, no, no time constraints, where where would you where do you see that idea also going if you had a chance? I'm a designer, so I wouldn't do any project that has no constraints. <laughs> if there's no constraints, you don't need a designer to do a project. Yeah. So I think that's one thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I can't un I can't answer the, answer the question based on that con that constraint mm. of not having a constraint. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but bringing this project to a wider scale, I think we, for us in this project, when I first uh. Uh, thought about it. Uh, it the, curatorial, uh, the curatorial intent here is really to shift the mindsets of the imagination of a person who visits the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, dealing with perceptions, what you know before, how you see the stories and how we transform your perception based on how you transform the stories in your mind, that was really the underlying intent of a curatorial point of view in an exhibition. Uh, the pieces were just vehicles. The, the design was just vehicles to make that happen. Mm. So for us, uh, it's something that we, unfortunately, we cannot measure. It's very difficult. But from how we saw the project took off in terms of publicity uh, and how people were really interested in telling the story for us, I think that was uh, a, 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 that, that achieved a good level of success. Yeah, I think so. Then I think this sort of quickly segues to a question that an uh, audience member had asked, which was, were there any further spin-off interests and efforts in R for Repair following both both uh, Singapore and London uh, exhibitions? R for Repair 3, uh, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I will f first start by saying no first and let's see how it goes. <laughs> All right, gotcha, gotcha. So um, I will now, I think, turn to, to Hongwei. I think there is a question here for you. Uh, that first says, hey, kudos for a great job representing Singapore. Um, and the question is, uh, I think it's quite open. I'll see how you want to go about it. But if the ultimate feedback validating your work is how people feel, does measuring only the quantifiable make better intangibles? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, everyone else can answer this too. <laughs> I think as a base, uh, we, as what Hans was saying, I think we need to work with a brief. We need to work with constraint, and I think that 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 pushes us to design something that uh, it's different. Uh, we need to uh, we need to understand what are the constraints in order to respond to it to act to it. Uh, so I think that that is a base. Uh, that's something that we have to do. Um, but in terms of the intangible, uh, I think that's something that yes, uh, it's difficult to measure, uh, and it's 
some it's difficult to quantify and to react against. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I mean it's something that we try to make our, our space meaningful and purposeful. And I think as what Leonard also has shared, uh, if people in the public can get it and respond on behalf of the designer, uh, as uh, seen from the case of Bishan Park, I think that was that's a very powerful respond that now the design can elicit from um, the public in, in, in the outcome. Okay, I'm going to take a shot at this. You know, this, this is really difficult for me, <laughs> but I'll try. Uh, so, from what I understand, okay, um, the quantifiables are normally uh, based on uh, uh, perp performative parameters, right? And that's, that's easy to measure, right? And uh, I believe with the advent of AI, especially, uh, you they they're gonna increasingly do that part of the business, right? So I'm, it's the intangible part that I think we can play a future role, right? because these are the part that is difficult to capture the feelings, the experience, the memories, and I think that's difficult uh, to subcontract out to the AIs. <laughs> Uh, and I think that's where we can remain relevant for the future, right? Uh, so I I don't think they're connected, actually, uh, not 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 so closely. One may provide information, but they are not directly connected, and 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 they both require different skill set. That would be my take. Well, for me, an exhibition is quite easy because, especially in this case, uh, uh, for both exhibitions, uh, the second one we had in, in London, we had an opening party at a space. In Singapore, we couldn't have an opening party uh, because it was during COVID, although the museum just opened. Uh, but I just happened to send everyone, to ask everyone to come down on the same date, so everyone happened to appear at the same time as well. Uh, and uh, in that session, it was the first time the owners saw their repairs being unveiled. They never saw in the process of how their objects were being creatively repaired. And in those sessions, both in London and Singapore, you know, we had a lot of tears in those sessions. People seeing the objects transformed in the first time. And it was very moving. Uh, so for me, uh, it was really that moment, in, especially in the Singapore edition, that I thought was really a powerful tool that design has always been uh, designed to do. It's really to move people and to create these experiences that we can all remember. Maybe you should share with us some of the videos. They'll be interesting. Okay. Um, we have just, I think, another question. I think this is quite an interesting one. Again, for Hong Wei, regarding the Singapore Pavili Pavilion. Um, and it's quite in theme with the discussion today. So the question is, since this is a temporary structure with a sustainability focus, were there any considerations for the use of the materials, the planting, uh, when the expo and Definitely. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a uh, it's a given. It's a six months exhibition period, um, and all the country pavilions have to go. I, I think on a bigger scale overall, um, the expo ground is planned as part of uh, Dubai Urban Master Plan two zero four zero. So key structures are are being retained. So we have the three key pavilions uh, in the expo ground that was retained as museums galleries and institutions that continue to serve uh, the occupants in the area. So I think there's a legacy uh, plans there. Uh, it's, it's something good that came out from the Expo. There definitely are alternative views that, you know, Expo is uh, not a really sustainable event. But see from a perspective that, you know, it's a once in five years event where uh, people come together to exchange ideas and innovations. And I think this is especially important now where we have a very diverse world and, uh, and the planet is getting sicker, right? So I think that that's uh, something that I think it's important to understand uh, from a, a high level uh, view of the expo. For, for the pavilion, of course, I think we tried to make sure um, we go light. It being a steel structure means that it can be erected quickly and uh, deconstructed quickly. Um, we also kept the palette as minimum as possible, so there wasn't too much 
uh, overlay in terms of material. And I think the plans was that um, after the six months event, uh, the pavilion was handed over to a local contractor that uh, salvage and repurpose and recycle whatever that they can uh, in, in Dubai. There were actually initially some plans to bring back one of the uh, one, if not all three, uh, cones uh, to Singapore, but we couldn't do that because uh, that will incur carbon footprint on the way back, and that does not um, fulfill the agenda of uh, sustainability. Uh, uh, also, I think from coming off from COVID, um, it also. Um, uh, Throw off some of the plans that we had. Uh, it was meant to be a uh, event that we could we wanted to connect Singapore with with Dubai, uh, but because of the circumstances, there was too many restrictions. Flying there was uh, almost impossible. We actually wanted to bring in Singapore ambas ambassadors uh, from the local tertiary to go there to represent and talk about Singapore and as well as representative of the Singapore brands to be there to, to show and tell about uh, the Singapore brand. So that, that couldn't happen. Uh, some parts of it happened through uh, video conferencing, which I think was something that uh, also came out from uh, the COVID situation. Thank you for that. So we have a nice big question for each of you. Uh, and I think please do take, each of you take your time to sort of answer this. So the question is, um, what do you envision for Singapore? Um, what design? Uh, what can the design community do, contribute, or lead the way towards a better future? Um, I may pick on Leonard to start first <laughs> because because I think it's in vain with what you were saying about making a difference. Um, so, if if you don't mind, yeah. <laughs> uh, well. Uh I'll, I'll just repeat what I said. I think we all can make a difference. I think I think we we need to step up and uh, see how we can contribute in our very little way, even if it's a small gesture, right? Uh, especially in design, design uh, affects people uh, and how they lead their lives. Uh, so, even though you you know you you are in the office, you are doing stuff, and you're wondering how, how does this impact, right? Uh, and, and that's the question you have posed to yourself, which whatever you do, right? Uh, am I doing impactful work? If uh, you're not, then maybe you should need to think about it, right? And try to make a change. But I understand that, you know, it is, uh, it is not something you can do, you know, at, at every point in time, right? It's a journey, like the journey that I took, right? I, I didn't make an impact for many years, right? You need to build to that uh, um, position where you can actually make real difference, right? But if you are along this journey, I think then you're on the right path. So maybe just to elaborate a little bit back on this, for you, what is impact? Or what is impactful in your view? Uh, making a difference in people's lives, mm -hmm. right? Uh, improving how we um, live with nature, right? Improving the environment. I could go all day. <laughs> um, care. Um, if I take a leave from uh, Kashin's and Joshua's uh, head care, I, I think head care is really to uh, better care by innovations or improvisation. So I think that that's a spirit that we all have to, I mean, regardless whether you're a designer or not, it's really a idea of being caring and to be able to care about your surroundings, your built environment, your, your space, right? Because um, being, being careless is, is wasteful, right? If you are being careful, then I think it's full of positive. Uh, I think that attitude uh, would, would resonate no, in whatever that uh, you, you do whether or not it's design or as a, as a user of the space. Yeah, I think uh, there's a shifting of paradigm in design. We used to treat design as a beautiful object, uh, as something that is artistic and nice. And I think the PDA changed that mindset in 2018, that it recognized the impact of the design to be impactful. Whatever we design, it has to be look good, but also 
have a purpose, right? And driven by, by what we give to the community, environment, and so on. And I think designers have a role solving the problem that we have. And there's a lot of problem we have. It can be from physical environment, it can be from digital environment, and that's the job of design. If we work together, who's doing this uh, collaboratively, I think, um, and through these awards also, uh, acknowledge that recognition, uh, the recognition of what designers have, have done. I think that's we, we can move forward in a bit, uh, in in a for a better 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 future, right? So, one thing in Tibet Eco Park is that we we involve a lot of collaborators, right? We don't just work as a landscape architect. We have an architect. We also like the signage and the visual identity. We involve a graphic designers to create this um, mascot for the for the parks. Uh, we also have a sculptor uh, artist that work on the sculpt sculpting the dragonfly and and squirrel into the park. So by doing that, we also give opportunity for many other field to be involved in the project. And I hope for any type of project, whether it's architecture, landscape, or object. It should be a collaborative works to strengthen the profession of designers. Uh, I was trained classically as an industrial designer uh, in my bachelor's. And uh, while, while I was in school, we call ourselves uh, landfill designers. Because industrial designers are essentially product designers. Most of what you see in landfills are products and objects. They last a long, long time. Your handphones, electronic circuits, computers, uh, products. Uh, these are all, most of these things have been, have gone through the hands of a designer or but in specifically an industrial designer. So certainly uh, designers have a big, big role to play in how we design a product. But at the same time, I think we should not just focus on the technical side of sustainability. I think we need to bridge the meaning gap. If you think about something that you have owned for the longest of time, unreasonably long, uh, usually you hold on to it not because it performs really well, or because you, it uses very well, not because it looks really good, but you have a special meaning attached to it, and I think that's the gap we need to bridge. Okay. Well, then I think we can have another question that I think is quite interesting. It's also something I was curious about, and this is for each of you. Um, I think an audience member here is interested to know what is next for you guys project-wise. So if you can, I mean, uh, if, if you are, if it's a... Uh, not sort of breaching confidentiality agreements, um, share a little bit of what you're working on or what, what other projects you hope for your, yourself to do and be involved in in the next couple of years. Maybe I can start by not talk, really talking about the projects themselves, but yeah. talking about philosophy. So uh, I believe that we can do better than sustainability. Uh, sustainability involves uh, maintaining the status quo. Right, uh, but you know we have wrought a lot of damage on the environment. We need to do better than that. We need to indulge in. Uh, we need to actually promote regenerative design, design that helps to uh, uh, remediate and 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 heal the environment. And we all have a role to play in that. Yeah, sustainability. Um, I was just explaining to my boy. I think a few days ago. Um, that I'm coming for this forum. Um, he came back with a homework and asked me about what is sustainability. I was like, you, they, you, they teach you in such words in uh, primary school now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I replied him, it's uh, the ability to sustain, right? So I, I think it's really very much how you can keep, um, you, you, have to, you, you need to design for with the ability to keep uh, the thing going the system going and um, or the cycles going. So I'm not sure whether he understood me or not, but I, I think that's something that I think all of us, uh, every every designers, planners, innovators are, are doing, right? It's really looking at uh, asking asking questions, right? Be curious about it, asking questions and uh, make, I think Mansam was also telling us, you know, make the problem as big as possible because that's where the opportunity lies, right? Once you're able to solve a, a big problem, you, you can solve many things. Because nowadays, everything, are so, everything is so interconnected. So I think that's, that's something that I think I, I echo what um, Leonard is saying, that you know, we, we need to look at uh, our projects, or our surroundings, our environment, uh, with different 
lenses, different optics, and ask questions. You know, does it really, uh, how does it help us uh, be sustainable? Um, maybe just to add the, the question about what's next, right? Uh, interestingly, uh, we were asked back to look at Enabling Village. Uh, there was a project done about 10 years ago. Um, um, back then, there wasn't, the, the brief wasn't quite firm. And uh, I think we, we, together with the client, went along. Uh, it was also a very quick project. We turned over uh, less than um, a year, or more, slightly more than a year, sorry. Um, but I think as um, over the years, uh, uh, it has attracted uh, users and occupants, and I think they have gotten more feedbacks on how to make uh, the village better. And uh, I think uh, we are, so it's it's also quite interesting that you now we get a second chance to go back to repair to see what uh, we can do more to make the space to value add to the space and make it even better. I think that's something that I'm looking out, I'm looking forward to to finish. I think design is not one person works, it's a team collaboration, you work with the teams. And, and the next for me is, uh, after we, we receive this award, it's really about uh, inspiring my team to, to, to our belief, to our design philosophy, so they engage, right? Uh, and ultimately, if we have a good team, then we have a happy clients, right? So that's the number one that we want to do for internally, to inspire our own teams. Second, uh, the impact of this award brought us uh, many new inquiries, right? For example, there's a one developer that has been constructed a concrete canal halfway, then they stop it. <laughs> <laughs> then they call me. <laughs> Can you do something like Turbot Eco Parks? So we were grateful because otherwise they will create this long 1.3 kilometer of similar canal that we have deconstructed at Turbot Eco Park and they want to build that, right? So, so that's what uh, interesting about if we have a successful projects, impactful projects, of course, Turbot Eco Park also inspired by Bishan Park, and this goes down to many other projects, and now it's to Jakarta. So, what's next is to continue improving, innovating, and find new solutions, and inspire many other people to do a better job. Yeah, uh, for me, I don't do long-term planning, so I have no idea what I'm going to do <laughs> next month. I just came off a sabbatical, a one-year sabbatical uh, that ended in June. Uh, it, I was supposed to cast a vision for myself. I realized that there's no point doing it, uh, but I'm just really excited to go back to teaching. Uh, for me, teaching is like designing the future. Your future is designing someone else's mind who's going to operate in the future and solve complex problems in the future. And for me, that is really a gratifying uh, position to be in and a very careful position to be in as well. Uh, and to that, my shortest term plan now is to be a parent that my child needs me to be. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. I think we will, this is the closing of the Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is all the time that we have today. Thank you very much to our fellow, pa uh, fellow panelists for inspiring sharing. Shall we give them another round of applause, please? Thank you. We have reached the end of the PDA 2023 Recipients Forum. We hope that you have enjoyed the forum and taken, taken away insightful points from our panel of PDA 2023 recipients. May I request for the audience to stay and take a group photo, and may I also invite the panelists to take their seats um, and with the audience as well so that we can take a group photo. <laughs>